Hi everyone, welcome to Five Code Shakespeare, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Themes, Symbols and Archetypes. In this series we do a close reading thematic analysis of all 17 chapters and in this video we're going to look at chapter 5, Diagon Alley. Three new important themes are introduced in this chapter. One is the motif of the borderlands, the departure point from which the hero leaves on the adventure and that is certainly the leaky cauldron. Diagon Alley itself can be seen as a metaphor for the labyrinth and the labyrinth is a metaphor of the subconscious. And before you can enter the labyrinth of your subconscious, you need guides. So we're going to talk about Ariadne. Harry does find his Ariadne. At the center of the labyrinth, at the center of your subconscious, you find your treasure if you're a worthy hero, and that is certainly depicted as Gringotts. The whole process requires supernatural aid, and we're going to talk about that today. And the whole process itself is uh, an initiation, and so we'll talk about that. Classism, snobbery, and bigotry, of course, are introduced in the character of Malfoy, so we'll talk about that. And two important themes are, are, are redeveloped and further developed in this chapter. One is the death of childhood, and the other is the hero's shadow his dark side. What I do in each video is first identify important characteristics of each theme and then we dig into the text and pull out several quotes that prove the claim. If you find these videos useful please like and subscribe and you can instantly download a copy of the PDFs I use in this series by visiting my shop and making a one-time purchase. See the description for details. In terms of plot, we are just getting ready to enter the unknown. Uh, Harry's leaving that the island hut behind, and he's on his way to London to enter the Leaky Cauldron, to enter Diagon Alley, who eventually go to Hogwarts. Do you see what's happening here? Chapter 5, we're just approaching the unknown. So a lot of interesting stuff is happening. Uh, one is the death of childhood, uh, as symbolized by the Charon figure. Uh, from ancient, ancient mythology, the, 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 the ferryman that helps, uh, uh, that, that escorts the souls of the dead from the realm of the living to the realm of the dead. And, and Hagrid twice, once here on the way to London from the island hut, and again later on, as you will, you will recall, after the Hogwarts Express journey, uh, Hagrid is the ferryman again, and he takes them across the waters, the waters being a symbol of that uh, crossing into the realm of, of, of death. Um, uh, to Hogwarts. Now, what does all that mean? It means the death of childhood. Harry Potter's not dying. He's just starting his life, but his old self has to die. And so that's the old motif of the death of childhood. So the crossing of water is an ancient, ancient old metaphor for death. You've seen it again and again. It's the transformation is what it symbolizes from one state of being into another. Death of childhood, the, the rebirth as a young adult. And Harry Potter 1, Hagrid is that Chiron figure, the ferryman, the escort of souls into this new other world. Harry's childhood self has died and he must be reborn on the opposite shore and learn new n learn the new requirements of the new circumstances. You're not a kid anymore. you got more learning to do. So very simply, the quote here uh, at the beginning of the chapter, they settle down in the boat. Harry's still staring at Hagrid in wonder. He's leaving the island hut, that, that existential nightmare and, and vacuum of, of that, of that uh, life with the Dursleys and he's crossing over in that boat to a new world. At this moment, uh, this is when they bump in, uh, they, they, they reach the shores of London, which again is a new world for Harry. He's the, the farm boy, quote unquote, you know, entering the big city. So at this moment, the boat bumped gently into the harbor wall. Hagrid folded his newspaper and they clambered up the stone steps to the street. So that's kind of a new world as well. That represents London and then London again is that departure point into the magic realm of Hogwarts. So the crossing is complete. Welcome to a new reality, young hero from the island hut to London. So that kicks it all off. And in London, of course, he enters the Leaky Cauldron, which is the Borderlands. The Borderlands is very familiar to all of us who've watched adventure stories of any kind at all. Um, Star Wars movies, the Lord of the Lord of the, the, the Rings. Uh, there's always this departure point where the hero has to leave the farm. They arrive in a big city and then get their stuff together and then from the big city they leave and in the big city they start to meet these strange characters and they get a first glimpse of what life is going to be like in this new realm and it's pretty darn scary so the borderlands is a place of departure here the novice hero encounters strangers who have braved the unknown remember that's where we're headed and lived to tell the tale the weather beaten experience and sometimes cynicism sometimes these characters like han solo in the very 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 first star wars movie was a brilliant borderlands character he's been out there he's done some nasty stuff he's seen some nasty stuff and the young wide-eyed novice is, is is trying to take all this in 
Is Han Solo cynical? I think so. You could, you could count him as one of these cynical guys. So the weather-beaten experience and cynicism of these characters contrasts very sharply with the wide-eyed na naivete and eagerness of the novice who receives intimations about the trials ahead. So it's pretty darn scary. The decision to accept the challenge happens here. Now this is where, yeah, so somebody tells you, here's, here's what you're going to encounter. Are you still willing to accept the challenge? And of course, in all the hero stories, the hero has to accept the challenge and all the hero stories are our stories. So these stories are telling us to, yes, accept the challenge, even if you were afraid. So here we see on page uh, 73, for a famous place, so this is when they first enter the Leaky Cauldron. For a famous place, the Leaky Cauldron was very dark and shabby. Of course it is, because you're entering the unknown. A few old women, the word old, you see how writers do this? They very subtly indicate that experience. That word old connects us to this experience and perhaps cynicism. A few old women were sitting in the corner drinking tiny glasses of sherry. One of them was smoking a long pipe. A little man at the top uh, in a top hat was talking to an old barman who was quite bald, so there's the oldness, and looked like a gummy walnut. So again, these strange characters set the mood, set the mystery, and indicate to the hero that you're not in Kansas anymore. You gotta go out and do something weird. Uh, and so Hagrid starts to explain uh, uh, um, Professor Quirrell, because Pref Professor Quirrell is the weirdest encounter that Harry uh, has here in the Leaky Cauldron. And, and Hagrid explains, he says, Professor Quirrell, poor bloke, brilliant mind. He was fine while he was studying out of books, but then he took a year off to get some firsthand experience. There's the word experience. They say he met vampires in the Black Forest and there was a nasty bit of trouble with a hag. Never been, uh, never been the same since. So this is what can happen to you, hero. It's not going to be easy. You could come back wounded, damaged, maybe destroyed if you're not worthy and if you don't if you don't level up your skills, this is what could happen to you. This is exactly what Hagrid is telling Harry in this departure point. Uh, never been the same since. So scared of the students, he's scared of his own subject, and then now where's my umbrella? So yes, scary stuff. And so the, Harry is now reeling, as he should be reeling. Vampires, hags, Harry's head was swimming. Hagrid, meanwhile, was counting bricks in the wall above the dust bin. So everyday crazy at the borderlands. Of course, what do you expect? You're entering the unknown. You're entering the labyrinth of your own soul. Where we had thought to travel outwards in these stories, we shall come to the center of our own existence. That's, the, that's what we're looking for. When we consume these stories, when we entertain ourselves, quote unquote, entertain ourselves with these stories, we are actually looking for ourselves. And this is what these stories tell us. So I got to keep repeating that quote because it's so, so true. So after the Borderlands crossing, Harry enters Diagon Alley, which is clearly depicted as a labyrinth. And loaded with mythic and psychological significance, this motif, the labyrinth motif, the maze, the caves, the wells, the water, any, any, any visual images of someone going down somewhere, an elevator, we're going to look at Inception, the movie Inception today, and they go down in an elevator, that's, that's the labyrinth. You're going into your own soul. You're going into your subconscious. And it's repeated in the Harry Potter series, book after book after book after book. book. So on page 76, we get our first look at Diagon Alley. And before he enters that, he has to solve, Hagrid has to solve a puzzle. And a puzzle is a kind of labyrinth. You got to put things together and he's counting up and down and right and across. That's a kind of labyrinthine image. Then the door opens. He tapped the wall three times and there's the magic number three with the point of his umbrella. And the brick he had touched quivered. It wriggled in the middle, a small hole appeared. It grew larger, wider and wider. A second later, they were facing a, uh, an archway large enough even for Hagrid, an archway onto the cobbled street, which twisted and turned out of sight. So two images of the labyrinth there. One is the puzzle that has to be uh, solved, and the other one is this labyrinthine uh, um, rabbit hole of rabbit worn of streets. Now, this also reminds us, of course, uh, when we were young and we first went to a big city. That's what it's like. It's a labyrinth. A city is almost like literally uh, a labyrinth. And when you are growing up and you go to the city for the first time, you are navigating it. Uh, in, the, in the outer world, physically you're navigating it just to get to your job or your school and back. And of course, what you're doing there is you're determining who you are in this new world as well. So it's working on many different levels here. It's a beautiful, beautiful, um, it's a beautiful motif and it's hardwired into our 
are high, the high religions, all of the high religions have their own version of a labyrinth. Uh, in the Christian context, it's uh, uh, cathedrals. This is Chartres Cathedral. And you can literally, you can go here. You've, you might have been here before. And this is what you're doing. You're trying to get to the center of yourself through the symbolism of, of the particular religion. And again, it's not exclusive to Christianity. It's all over the place in our myths and religions. And again, Joseph Campbell beautifully puts it here. Let me read this for you. The passage of the mythological hero may be overground only incidentally. The, 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 the traveling through the forest, traveling through the cities, traveling over the mountains, that's just incidental, the outward journey. Fundamentally, it is the journey is inward into the depth where obscure resistances are overcome, your own weaknesses, your own strengths are being developed, and long lost forgotten powers are revivified to be made available for the transfiguration of the world. Now at the highest level of the, the world saviors figures in all of the high religions and the, the old myths as well, their job is to go, into the, to go into the center of themselves, find what there is there, like the Buddha on the mountain, find what the Buddha finds on the mountain, which is in himself, and then bring it back to the world to transform the world. Now, what transforms the world? If you've read all the Harry Potter books, and you should have, then yeah, you know what transforms the world. It is love, and that is indeed the message that these great religions tell us. Beautiful. So this deed accomplished, life, no, now, what does, what does the hero bring back? What does the Buddha bring back? The Christ bring back? Muhammad bring back from, you know, Shiva bring back from his journey inward slash outward? He brings back something that love which makes life bearable that's why we call them the world saviors this deed accomplished life no longer suffers hopelessly under the miserable mutilations of ubiqu ubiquitous disaster yes we suffer we do suffer but not hopelessly that's the key harry potter suffers miserably but he doesn't suffer hopelessly battered by time hideous throughout space but with its horror now this is interesting too with its horror visible still its cries of anguish still tumultuous. It becomes penetrated. Life becomes penetrated by an all-suffusing, all-sustaining love and a knowledge of love's unconquerable power. You're not running away from the pain of life. That's what these stories tell us. Harry suffers and suffers and suffers, and we watch him suffer, and we want him to suffer because by observing his suffering and his conquering of that suffering through love, through active participation in the suffering of the world, we see uh, an image of our own life's journey. And so it does, it makes life bearable. It's the great existential question. Go back and look at some of my other videos and my Shakespeare videos about the existential problem and how the heroes either overcome that existential problem, which is this, how do you deal with the suffering of life? Why not just kill yourself? But we don't because we see that there's something that makes life worth living not running away from the pain of life, but confronting it directly and moving through. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful message, and we say we tell it again and again and again. Now, add, added, this is this this. These are the world save with the world saviors, of course. But as I've mentioned and as I've suggested, so through authentic living in our own lives and coming to the center of our own being and seeing what's good there and trying to get rid of what's bad there, but confronting what's ever there. Through that kind of authentic living and full realization of ourself, the microhero, that's you and I, ladies and gentlemen, the microhero does the same thing as this. Our fiction, and I put fiction in quotes here because what is, it's not, these aren't lies that we're telling ourselves. These stories that we tell ourselves are like the, um, when you, when you, when water is flowing down a drain, it's, there's a funnel action that's being made. Each individual water molecule is, is disappearing it's, that's the thing that's limited in time and space. But the funnel itself is something that never, never goes away. And so these hero stories, the hero's quest story that I've been talking about is like this, this, this principle of physics that is above each individual's, my life as Rodney Robertson. I'm a molecule of water going down that funnel. But the hero's quest story is this cosmic physical physics principle that never never goes away and that's how that's why I put the word fictional because these fictions are the funnel and you can put Luke Skywalker into them you can put Ray into them you can put you know Frodo into them but it's the same funnel do you see what I'm saying but all these heroes that were the stories that we're telling ourselves those are the molecules of water that are going down that taking that funnel action so our fictional macro heroes they show us how we can save the world in our own micro ways. So it's absolutely gorgeous. 
In order to survive the labyrinth, though, we do need spirit guides, and we're, go we're going to talk about the figure of Ariadne. And if you've seen the movie Inception, and I hope you have, uh, Inception is right out of this. It's exactly what we're talking about here. The ancient Greek story of Theseus and the Minotaur is old, old, old. It's thousands of years old. And as I, as I suggested, this, these stories, we keep telling them again and again because they're, they're real. They're not fictions. They're real in some kind of cosmic sense. Well, here, we, you, you, you might remember this. This is a medieval painting of that ancient Greek uh, story, which fascinates us because, it, as, as we've suggested, it is our story. So Theseus has to go into the labyrinth physically in the outward journey in these stories but really he's going into his own subconscious and at the center of it he has to slay his own dragons he has to slay the monsters of his own psyche and find the treasure there and you can't do that unless you have help you can't go alone the world is filled with sad sad stories sad people sad sad stories of people who don't have that adequate adequate guidance. If you're growing up without a mother, if you're growing up without a, a father, you, you don't have an immediate Ariadne figure to give you the string, the guiding string that you can use to help navigate your way into and then back out of your terrifying journey. Uh, if you've seen this movie Inception, and I, if you haven't, go watch it. It's brilliant. And it's a retelling of the Theseus and the Minotaur and the Ariadne story. And she l quite literally in the movie is named Ariadne. There you go. Christopher Nolan. Brilliant. Christopher Nolan knows his archetypal stories. And if you're a writer out there or want to be a writer and you don't know your archetypal stories, then you're not a good writer because you have to know these things. And then you manipulate them in different ways to tell them in different uh, in different times and circumstances but yeah he's got he's got psychological problems he's got psycho psychic problems inwardly outwardly he has to save the world there you go <laughs> there's a retelling of it and he's having a hard time doing it alone and he wants to go alone because he's stubborn like any good hero but he accepts his he accepts his uh, his Ariadne help and she guides him out of it so Hagrid of course as you see now Harry has many Ariadne's throughout the whole story. Professor McGonagall, Dumbledore, of course, even Ron and Hermione are these helpers. And all of these helpers are, are Hagrid figures and they're Ariadne figures. Uh, Hagrid and all helpers are Ariadne figures who provide the guiding threads required for successful navigation of the internal and external terrain. Without those guides, you are doomed. And this is another beautiful quote by Campbell. It is indeed very little that we need, but lacking that, the adventure into the labyrinth is without hope beautiful it's a look you can barely see it in the painting it's it's a thread it's just a thread that's all you need you need a, a, a mother figure a father figure whether or not they're biological or not doesn't matter you need somebody to to care for you and then you need your buddies along the way you need all these little support along the way and that gets you into the center and it gets you out again alive uh, it's a beautiful it, it is it's, it's a beautiful story um, what do you find when you're at the center? When you slay your dragons at the center, when you slay your minotaurs, you find your treasure. Gold is great. It's nice and shiny. It's pretty to look at. It's worth a lot, so you can live a decent life if you got some of it. But in the stories that we tell, the, the, the treasure that we're seeking in these stories is only very, very superficially money, gold. What we're really looking for is the perfected self. That's what we're hunting for. And in order to get the, to the per, per, uh, perfected self, you've got to enter the labyrinth, of course. So as with the model of the hero's journey, that's that eternal model that will never, never go away. The labyrinth motif emphasizes the need for the hero to seek out your demons, seek out your Voldemorts, your dragons, and slay them. Seek out your minotaurs and slay them. And what you will find once you slay your demons is you will find the treasure at the center of your being. That's what's going on in these stories. And the hero stories that we tell ourselves again and again and again are trying to guide us towards our own uh, uh, perfection as, as, as to the extent that that's possible. So here we are, Gringotts. Gringotts is indeed at the center of Diagon Alley. They go through it, they look at a bunch of fancy stuff, and then they go down, 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 down. The subterranean, subconscious core of the labyrinth. This is the first of several labyrinths in Harry Potter. Hogwarts itself is a labyrinth. In the, at the end of this particular book, we're going to look at when they go down to confront um, Voldemort uh, at the bottom of the, of the castle, that's another labyrinth. So again and again and again, these motifs are repeated. 
that's storytelling. That's great archetypal storytelling, and you can't you can't swerve from that because it's part. It's it, because it's biological. It's it's psychic biological. It's hardwired into who we are and how we develop as humans. Uh, so here we see they have to navigate the maze. So when they first enter Gringotts, Gringotts is depicted as a labyrinth. They uh, they were in a vast marble hall. That's labyrinthine already. And there were too many doors to count leading off the hall. That's labyrinthine. They were in a narrow stone passageway, labyrinth with flaming torches. It sloped steeply downwards into the psyche, down, down, down. That's where we go, into wells underwater. And there were little railway tracks along the floor. At first, they just hurtled through a maze. There's an actual repetition of a synonym for labyrinth, of twisting passage, labyrinth. Harry tried to remember left, right, left, right, left, right, labyrinth, 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 all over the place. But it's impossible. Welcome to your psyche, hero. So at the center of the labyrinth, why are we going through all this? Why bother? Because we're trying to find ourselves. We're trying to find our perfected self. So at the center of the labyrinth, Harry finds an unexpected but not unearned manifestation of his self. He finds the gold at the center of this. Now, when, when I first read this, it's kind of cheesy. It's kind of like the storybooky kind of, oh, oh, gold, lucky you, you got gold. Not everybody all of a sudden wakes up and is super rich. But it, it wasn't unearned, and that's the key. So we're going to talk about that in the next slide. But let's talk about gold itself as that metaphor first. It's a precious metal. Uh, gold does not, uh, like phys the physical properties of, properties of gold are what make it sim a symbol throughout our throughout our history we've symbolized gold because it's it seems to be a perfect metal it doesn't corrode or doesn't decay and it therefore has tremendous symbolic as well as practical power over the ages we've used gold as money but we've also used it in all of our storytelling alchemy alchemy is uh, um uh, the, the, the story of alchemy was is important to Harry Potter, actually, and we're going to talk about that in later chapters. And that's the that's the attempt to change base lead, this crappy metal, into something that's a perfect metal, which is uh, um, which is gold. So here's from the interpretation of fairies. So gold, as a most precious metal, has always in the planetary system been ascribed to the sun. The sun is the greatest of the stars, and why not aim for that? And gold is generally associated with incorruptibility and immortality. So you want to be some kind of hero? It's a good idea to try to be incorruptible and as immortal as possible, you see. Okay, so uh, Harry does. Harry does reach the center and he does find his gold as a symbol of the highest attainment of the soul. This gold does truly belong to Harry, as I've said. It was earned. How did he earn it? He's only a little kid. He didn't even know he had it. His parents left it to him. Is he, what's the word for it? Is he... Um, uh, 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 is he oh, what is uh, a trust fund baby? Is he a trust fund baby? No, he's not. He's not a trust fund baby. He earned that gold through immense suffering at Privet Drive. Like all of the great high religion heroes, he suffered, suffered, suffered before he achieved some kind of enlightenment, which is what he's experiencing right here. And he suffered during the first cycle of his hero's journey when Harry encountered conquered and survived the darkest of the underworld powers, Voldemort, the monster, the minotaur, the dragon, and now he has to do it all over again. So go back and watch my first video. I, I showed how very cleverly J.K. Rowling starts the Harry Potter series after he starts, she starts the Harry Potter cycle of hero stories after the first, the very first cycle of hero stories happened when Harry was a baby. Very, very clever storytelling. So yeah, he did earn this. So here's the warning, uh, uh, the Gringotts warning before you enter this. You better make sure that you are a worthy hero. You better make sure you're worthy. Malfoy would not encounter this. He'd be gobbled up by Gringotts because that, that's not his. Malfoy hasn't earned it, do you see? So if you seek beneath our floors the treasure that was never yours, you, if you aren't worthy for this, if you haven't earned it in the way that Harry has, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. You're going to burn. So the pretenders and cheats need not apply. You must be worthy. You must, you must not be a, a cheater. Uh, and Hagrid, once they get inside, he says very, very significantly, it's yours. And that's 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 not just here you go, here's some money, Malfoy. No, it's actually quite, quite meaningful in the way that we just described. Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of uh, little gold canuts, all yours, smiled Hagrid. Truly, Harry is no pretender. The self, Harry, is waiting for you. And of course, Harry, in later books, what makes him special is the uh, is is the capacity for love that was passed on to him from his parents and from the Ariadne figures, from the Dumbledore figures uh, and his friends and things like that. He becomes the worthy hero. Beautiful storytelling, very, very beautiful. 
Before the hero enters the dark forest, they must encounter their helpers and their mentors, as we've seen, and Harry has. And they also have to receive tools. They have to receive a, the, the great sword that they pull from the stone or whatever it is. They have to receive, receive some kind of supernatural aid or some kind of tools or whatever it is. If you're watching a sci-fi movie or, or reading a sci-fi book, it's very often a technological gift from one of the mentors. They have to receive this kind of aid. And in, cha in chapter five, we see Harry receives many of the Ariadne threads that's the tool that'll help you get out of the la into and out of the labyrinth that he will need to develop his skills and talents in the dark forest, which means Hogwarts. He, they're looking at robes. He buys robes. He gets books. He gets a cauldron. He gets a telescope and potion ingredients. And most importantly, uh, the owl. And most importantly, still is the wand. And we're going to go deeply into the significance of the wand because that's actually developed in a lot of uh, a lot of detail in the book, for good reason. So Hedwig, as we've talked about in previous videos, go back and watch Harry Potter chapter three. We've talked about Hedwig as a symbol of the subconscious because it's a no nocturnal uh, uh, image, the, the, the owl. Uh, Hagrid, H Hedwig now, he owns it. In the first chapters of the book, they're kind of external. They're just messengers from the unknown, messengers from the unknown that are still quite distant from Harry. Here in chapter five, he actually possesses one, which means he's, he's much, much closer to his own subconscious than he was before. So no longer a mere messenger or harbinger from the unknown, but now a known part of Harry's conscious self. He's growing. That conscious self is growing in awareness and it's growing in integrated powers. You got to go down into yourself, find out who you are and what kind of beast powers you have in you and bring them out to make them uh, 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 powerful in the world. So Hagrid is the one, he's the spiritual, he's the, he's the mentor, he's the helper, and he's the one that provides the tool. He's the one who provides the owl. I'll get you an owl. All the kids want owls. They're dead useful. They carry your post and everything. 20 minutes later, they left Elop's Owl Emporium, which had been uh, dark and full of rustling and flickering. Jewel bright eyes. Harry now had a large cage, which had a beautiful snowy owl. So all these symbols too, they make it something magical. They make it something important. They make it something close to gold. It's jewel bright. It's not the gold, but it's jewel, so it's gold adjacent. Okay, so thanks, Harry Ariadne Hagrid. I could use that owl. Most important, of course, is the wand, and we're going to spend some time on that. So far, we've talked a lot about the hero finding himself, and it can seem kind of narcissistic and solipsistic uh, to focus so much attention on that. That's really important, of course. But in all of these stories as well, there's an, an initiation into the Jedi Order. And what that means, even that or the word order, the Jedi order, think about that. That's it's it's monstrous. Society needs you to make itself better and to renew itself. But society has its requirements and you're not just this free spirit to become, oh, I found myself and now I'm going to be good in the world. That's not how it works. You've got to fit yourself into the requirements of society so that you can do good for that society. And there are rules and there are things that you have to learn. And Harry, all students, as you know, as a student, you suffered, 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 suffered to gain the knowledge of the past. And once you gain that knowledge, then you're ready to take yours, that self that you found at the center of your Gringotts and put it to good use in the world. But you can't put your gold to good use in the world if you don't know what the world is. And that's what you've got to do by learning the past. And that's what's happening with the bestowing of the wand. It's a beautiful, beautiful scene. So of course, the wand is the most important and obvious symbol of the self. As Harry enters uh, Ollivander's, the tone is intense, almost religious. It's like entering a church. A church is a quiet library kind of atmosphere where you in the you are in the presence of a past that you don't quite understand yet and you know you have to come to understand in order for you to to function well in the world and how do we encounter that when we enter a church even if you're not a believer of any kind when you enter a religious structure and i've traveled a lot in the world and i've entered a lot of these structures in all different religions and there is a sense of awe even if i'm not a believer there's a sense of awe a sense of reverence a sense of wonder for something that i am a small 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 part of and i want to know more about that 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 tradition so awe, reverence, and wonder are the appropriate responses to such occasions, these initiatory occasions. The meeting of the ineffable design, divine, something that we don't understand. There's something beyond our comprehension. And I think our cultures uh, try to imbue that with uh, the greatness of the past. Uh, and the meeting of the ineffable divine in us and of us, because we are part of that as well. And that's part of the great mystery of knowing that, that your history, your cultural, spiritual history, is not something separate from you. 
you are part of it and to find out what that connection is, is is one of the great things of becoming educated. Our social in- initiation rites once carried the weight of this mystery. We, we, we did. We, if, if the, the West, as I've said before, we've lost a lot of the, the, the religious component of this. And without it, uh, um, a young person has a really difficult time trying to figure out who he or she is and how they fit into this m- huge, huge, huge you know, it, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a steamroller of a of a of an entity that we encounter when we when we think about our place in our culture because we are we are so ignorant of it until you become unignorant of it. So here here is the description that J.K. Rowling uh, uh, depicts of the encounter with the holiness of the uh, of Ollivander's shop. So the last shop was narrow and shabby. Again, the oldness, the ancientness of it. Peeling gold letters over the door of red Ollivander's maker of fine wand since, oh my goodness, what's this? That's 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Holy moly, is this what I'm entering? Is this what I have to absorb? I have to absorb the knowledge of the last 3,000 years? Can I? Well, if you're a worthy hero, you put your nose to the grindstone, and you do. So a single wand lay on a faded purple uh, cushion in the dusty window. Again, that's the age. A tinkling bell. So there's some kind of magic, you know, the, if you're in the Muslim world, the call to prayer is that kind of tinkling bell. And if you're in a Christian environment, the, tink, the, the bells are the bells. A tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as you're entering a cathedral. At the very, very end is the altar, and there's something very mystical about those depths. The depths of a shop as they stepped inside. Harry felt strangely as though he had entered a very strict library. And a library is literally a repository of the past, of thousands of years of knowledge of the past that you better make yourself worthy of taking on, do you see? Harry swallowed a lot of new questions, which had just occurred to him good that's what you you need to be curious but you also have to be reverential so he knows that it's not his place to to when you enter a new institution a new job you shut up for six months right and so here's the new the here's the novice entering something that he doesn't understand yet so he shuts up first listen 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 then ask your questions do you see Uh, He had a lot of new questions which had occurred to him, and he looked instead at the thousands of narrow boxes neatly piled right along the ceiling. Again, thousands. It's massive. You were encountering a culture that you are a small part of, but you don't understand yet, so be reverential. Explore. Learn. So for some reason, uh, the back of his neck prickled. This is it. This is what you feel. If you are... If, if you're a nature lover, you go to nature and it's being in the beautiful forest on the mountaintop is that sense of awe as well. So it doesn't matter where you're finding this reverence, uh, this, this connection to the divine. It, it, it's, it, it gives us that kind of feeling. There, there's a, there's a, a sense of encounter with the ineffable, un, ununderstandable not understandable, divine in us and of us and around us. So the very dust and silence in here seemed to tingle with some secret magic. Beautiful, beautiful religious imagery here. And again, I'm not approaching this from a religious point of view. It's, it's, something, it's something else. It's something, it's something universal in, the human, uh, uh, in, in, in our human psyches. Uh, cave paintings. Tens of thousands of years old. We've been doing this. There are ancient caves where the first churches. This is what we did, and we did encounter this awe in these the initiatory rites of the of the ancient shaman, in these trim, primitive tribes. These very 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 old tribes. When 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 a young person like Harry has to do what he's doing here, they would go into these caves, pitch dark, and they would they would starve themselves, or they would take hallucinatory drugs in order to get them, and they would terrify the youth, and they would jack up the nervous system. Uh, through, as I said, through drugs or fasting or, or eating something, they would jack up the nervous system very much like this, so that you would feel this 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 tingling sensation, this this sense of uh, of of encounter with the divine, and that's what they did in these caves, because these caves would have been terrifying with no no light. So it, it, it's a frisson. It, it's it's a you, that's the that's the that's the description of what. Harry's feeling here. There's a thrill and there's a fear at the same time, uh, connected, uh, uh, summarized by that particular word. It's 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 very interesting. So the frisson of encounter is very very old. The ancient mystery cults. If you just just Google mystery cults, the ancient Roman uh, Greco Roman mystery cults, and even the prehistoric shamanic rituals were designed to impress upon the initiates the magnitude 
of the change that was about to occur. The death of the old self, the birth of the new. It's huge. It's a big thing. The change is momentous and it's, it's, it's very meaningful and it's important. So we use literal caves. I've talked about caves as a symbol of the subconscious of the labyrinth. The labyrinth is a kind of cave. And yes, we actually use literal caves for the purposes of this psychic transformation. And this is what's happening with Harry in Ollivander's. Mr. Ollivander had come so close that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes. Though that's the that's those are the eyes of the culture. That's his culture, and Harry sees himself in that culture. That's the connection that you feel. That's what we're looking for. We don't want to be separate. It's an existential, existential crisis if we feel ourselves cut off from, uh, uh, from, from our culture in that way. But Harry's not cut off. He's, he sees the connection here. And it's spooky, and it's weird, and it's fearful. Nothing will be the same. Something's going to change, and something greater than a mere tool. So you're not just getting a device. You're not just getting an owl, which is kind of a, a spirit mess, messenger of some kind, uh, some kind of aid. No, it's something deeper than that. The wand is really, really special. So Ollivander is that kind of spooky shamanic priest. So like the sorting hat, and we're going to talk about this initiation theme again when we talk about the sorting hat, of course. So like the, but this, this is cooler. This, this is more mystical than the sorting hat, I think. So like the sorting hat ritual in chapter seven, the wand bestowing is a kind of baptism into the ancient, into an ancient institution. That's what I'm saying. The weight of the past, the gravity of the past, the gravity of your culture. That's what you're entering and you got to do it. This opens up a whole new world of knowledge, of power, of potential. You can harness it. If you learn what your culture's got to give you, you can take that and you can add your powers to it and you can move forward in the world. So the new world, uh, it opens up a new world of knowledge, power, and potential, as well as obligations and requirements of conformity. Now that's the dark side as well. And there's lots of stories that we tell too, about the there's too much weight of the past and that can actually crush the hero. So it's a tricky balance to get those two, those two things right. I've talked about it in my Shakespeare videos again and again and again, the conflict of self versus society, self versus society. How much do you owe to your development of the self and how much do you owe to society and, and, the, and the forwarding of your society? Romeo and Juliet is a good example where the crushing weight of society ends up destroying the two youths, the two heroes, do you see? So so, so it's not always good. And, and, and culture can impose uh, requirements that are overwhelming for the hero as well. Uh, but, but when done right, uh, we, we can see we can harness that power. So the whole exchange conveys a sense that Harry is entering something greater than himself, the gravity, the weight of, of this, something that he can serve, which is what we seek in religious rituals. Yes, we do want to serve something. We do, we do, we do, we do, we do. As much as we say in the West, particularly, we say, I'm me, I'm me, I'm going to develop myself. And that kind of narcissism and solipsism uh, leads only to, to, to problems. We have to feel, we need to feel that we are serving something great. How many hours a day globally do boys spend playing video games? And what are they doing in those video games? They're serving something greater than themselves. I play video games myself, I absolutely love them. And when I don't feel like I'm doing something heroic, and what does, what's the definition of heroic? It's serving is what it is. And if we don't feel like we're serving something, we feel, we feel isolated and alone, and we feel that existential crisis. So we do, we have to give ourselves to something. And that something is our, in, our are our institutions. They can be corrupt. They've got to be revitalized by the hero, as I've, as I've suggested, like the Romeo and Juliet uh, example, but we need to harness the power of that and we need to feel like we're some part of something bigger. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. Sense of destiny, that's what we're looking for. Sense of destiny, doing something good in the world. It, it's really the one that chooses the wizard, of course, very, very famous phrase, and that's what it's all about. Y you're, not, you're not free to do whatever you want, buddy. You're not free to just, oh, I'm going to have fun because I'm wonderful me. I'm going to go through life serving me, serving me. That's not how it works. You serve something greater. And that greater thing that you're serving is humanity. And that's where the love comes in. And that's where J.K. Rowling builds love into this story so, so beautifully. Harry took the wand. And what does he feel when he takes the wand, when he makes that connection with those ancient institutions with something that's cosmic, that's with something that's spiritual in nature, he feels that warmth in his fingers. That's the communion with powers that are beyond his understanding at the moment. But look at Dumbledore. Look at the very, very last book here where, where he encounters Dumbledore in his psyche, heaven slash heaven. When he encounters that, Dumbledore has come to understand this power. But here's the young novice, the young person, the young hero, encountering it for the first time and it's absolutely beautiful so the initiate is encountering the ineffable 
divine in him, of him, and of the universe. And he's excited to be entering into it. Gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. Okay, so as, as, as positive and lovely as that is, the hero also has to have his shadow, and, uh, and this chapter repeats that theme as well. Harry's identification with the wand ritual is complicated, of course, because Ollivander freaks out when he realizes that Harry's wand is the brother of Voldemort's wand. As the world savior, Harry contains the knowledge and power of both good and evil. The world savior needs that kind of knowledge. They're not naive. They know. They know everything. They've looked at evil and sadness in the face, and they bring love to the game. That's what the world savior is. So they have to know all of this stuff. And J.K. Rowling brilliantly retells that that old, old, old motif. So Ollivander senses this and is rightly fearful and impressed. So here he says, I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter, every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather is in your wand gave another feather, just one other. It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother, why its brother gave you that scar. I'm gonna talk in, uh, in, in later uh, chapters of the, the Cain and Abel story, the brother murder story. Uh, and and that's, that's the motif of the brothers, very, very subtly introduced here. Uh, the fact that it's a phoenix feather is not insignificant at all because as we learn in, in future chapters, uh, the phoenix is the, the bird of rebirth, death and rebirth, death and rebirth, cycles of death and rebirth, death and rebirth. And where have we seen that before? Harry's dying to his old childhood self now and like a phoenix being reborn in a new form uh, as an adult. Harry swallowed. Yeah, you should. You should be nervous. Yes, 13 and a half inches. You. Curious indeed how these things happen. The wand chooses the wizard, remember. There's something bigger than you, young individual. There's something bigger than you that you're going to be involved in. And it's glorious. It's painful. It's sad. And it's glorious. So go. I think we must uh, expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Yes, terrible. Yes, but great. So here we come down to uh, the, the hero's choice. And in, in future chapters, we're going to talk about J.K. Rowling's great theme, the existential question of how, of, we, of, of how you're going to choose to live. We are our choices. This is the great existential crisis. It's the great existential question. Okay, so uh, this is Harry's second invitation in Chapter 5 to allow his shadow to dominate. So here's the, here's the invitation. Yeah, go ahead. You can join Slytherin. You can become the force for evil in the world. Harry, go ahead. It's your choice, young man, young woman, if this, that's your adventure. Uh, and he, Harry had, had the, that invitation as well when he encountered Malfoy. At the micro level, it's Malfoy who invites Harry to become evil. Uh, and, uh, and at the macro level, of course, it's Voldemort uh, who, who he has to confront. So as we have seen, the hero must possess a dark side, but be able to harness that dark side and put it to good use. Like all good mentors, and all throughout the series too, it's really, really interesting how Dumbledore gives Hermione the time turner and says, eh, you figure it out. You figure it out. The mentor helper comes in, gives the supernatural, gives the supernatural or technological aid, and then gets out of the way so the young person can develop their powers. That's great, great, great parenting. So, like a good mentor, Ollivander leave, leaves it up to him. You could be great, Harry. You could be great. You make the choice. Okay, so we'll wrap this up with his encounter with Malfoy and the introduction of a very important theme. At the, we're going in this chapter. It's at the micro level: classism, snobbery, bigotry, and by extension, racism. It's at, it's introduced at a micro level here between two school uh, school um, schoolmates, and of course, at the macro level, it's it's Voldemort and the Death Eaters. Chapter 5 introduces the recurring theme of bigotry, which becomes one of the dominant themes of the entire seven-book series. Allegorically here, we see it at, at a micro level. We see Draco Malfoy represents the old world's aristocratic class. Um, Europe, uh, uh, Japan, all the, the ancient cultures of the world do have an aristocratic class that we don't quite have in the same way in, in New World countries, North and South America, and places like Australia. Uh, in those places, we would call it kind of old money. If you read The Great Gatsby, which is another great book, but there's the difference between old money and new money. So there is a kind of new aristocratic class. But J.K. Rowling's very firmly uh, uh, depicting the Malfoys as this old world, you know, the, 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 the dukes and the earls and stuff like that, which we don't really have in, in, in new world countries. So it would be called old money in the, old, in the new world context. So the theme expands, of course, as you know from reading the books, the theme expands to include notions of racism and bigotry generally. And what does that mean? It's the prejudice against an individual based on group membership. What group do you belong to? 
Are you redheads? Oh, then you're out of our group. Do you see? That's that's ultimately what it's about. And J.K. Rowling is uh, very, very critical of that. Uh, very, very unfortunately natural tendency in human beings. It's everywhere. Social identity theory, in-group, out-group theory. Just Google it and you've seen it a thousand times. You've lived it because you are a human being and so you are guilty of all of this yourself. And I include myself in that as well. So social identity theory asserts that people have a natural incl inclination to perceive their in-group in a positive light while being neutral or even negative towards out-groups. Now, why do we do that? We enhance our self-image. If I can just say to everybody who belongs to that group is a moron or evil, then I puff myself up, do you see? That's, it's a form of virtue signaling. And I just found that from Simply Psychology. It's all over the place. You know what this is. And it's very, very tragic. And J.K. Rowling explores it uh, uh, in an allegorical sense through uh, the macro story of Voldemort. Uh, as the name suggests, Draco and bigotry, Draco the dragon, Draco and bigotry, bigotry becomes one of the dragons that Harry must slay with love. Their encounters are a microcosm. So when Harry and Draco are, are fighting, dueling it out, their encounters are a microcosm of the macrocosmic battle that Harry will have to fight with the totalitarian Voldemort, because that's where this ultimately leads. Social identity theory, when not reined in by other social forces, can lead to a kind of totalitarianism, which means you got one tyrant at the top, and the tyrant says, everybody in my group, yeah, you got some benefits by society, and everybody in the out group, we're just going to send you off to the gulag. Okay, so here's the encounter with Malfoy, and it's very, very obvious, of course. I really don't think they should let the other sort, look at the language here, the other sort, that's the group membership, in, do you? And he's talking, of course, of, about uh, muggles. They're just not the same. They've never been brought up to know our ways. Some of them have never even heard of Hogwarts until they get the letter. Imagine that. Tut, tut, tut. So this is very much the voice of, of something that I'm not quite familiar with as a Canadian uh, because I, there are snobs, of course, uh, uh, all over the place. Like I said, the, the, the new money snobs. Uh, but, but that's very much the voice of aristocratic European culture and, and other cultures with an aristocratic tradition as well. Um, I think they should keep it in the, in the old wizarding families. What's your, what's your surname anyway? In Canada, we don't go by surnames. We go by other means of determining which is the proper in-group, do you see? But in the old world, it's the surnames, do you see? It feels good to be superior, right? Right, ladies and gentlemen, isn't this a lovely thing? Doesn't it make you feel good and all puffed up to be part of your own in-group and to be able to cast all of your evilness, your own internal evilness onto an out-group? First things first, let's establish our in-group status and then I will see whether or not I want to be part of you. Okay, so this is just the very, very first introduction of it. Very, very brief, but this is how she does it over seven whole books. It's brilliant. This just expands, 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 expands. And as you know, the final books of this series are not for kids at all. They're for, for mature young adults and adults for sure. But here we see at the micro child level, introduction to it for children. Brilliant, brilliant storytelling. Okay, that was Five Coach Shakespeare, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 5, Diagon Alley. I hope you found it useful. And if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And don't forget to pick up a copy of the PDFs if you need them. Thanks for watching.